hour of Art Bell was recorded for rebroadcast at this time. Please do not call. Welcome to Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped, and yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. This is Dreamland. Good evening. It is Sunday evening, and this indeed is Dreamland. If you're just tuning in for the first time... And many of you out there are, as the network continues to grow at a, an accelerated pace, you're in for a real treat. This is a different kind of program. We do it once a week. We have a regular syndicated program, uh, an all-night talk show, which I'm sure you'll get familiar with if you are not yet. But uh, Dreamland occurs but once a week, Sunday evening. It examines, as the little billboard just said, two very important areas, two important questions for mankind. Whether there is another life following this one, and we follow all kinds of avenues in trying to answer that question, and whether we are being, have been, or will be visited from others. And we'll touch on just about all of it, uh, <laughs> one way or the other, I'm sure, this evening. First, way out in Seattle, uh, uh, Seattle, is Linda Howe, and Linda is at the MUFON convention, a big confab uh, going up, uh, going on up in the Seattle area. Um, obviously, of the big people in the UFO world. And so, since we have a reporter on the spot, that's where we'll go in just a moment. That will be first. Do you have uh, scaling in your uh, in your house, in your pipes, in your water heater, in everything you drink, in all of the water that you wash your clothes with, wash your car with? Do you have scaling in there? Well, it's easy to find out if you've got the guts to go check. All you've got to do is go take the aerator off your uh, faucet and look in there and see if you see white, crusty stuff. Or for a, you know a real adventure, go in and look at the sh shower head and see if it's coated and clogged. Well, I had all that. I live out. Hello, Linda. Are you there, Linda? Oh, gee, have we lost Linda? Let's try this again. Hello, Linda. Yeah. All right. Linda. Can you hear me? Oh, you are there. Yeah, we've never left the phone. Maybe there was a button on your end or something that did, didn't get pushed. Could be. <laughs> right here. Oh, good. Um, but yes, I am in Seattle. It has been an extraordinarily, uh, I think, fruitful Newfound Conference exploring uh, both some of the uh, more details of historic areas like the old Blue Book Report up to the current day controversies around Roswell. And in between, I have received new reports about crop circle formations in the United States, in Inman, Kansas, and Alva, Oklahoma, and new mutilation reports from Maple Valley, Washington, and Kansas City, Missouri, which I'll be reporting on in future Dreamland. All right. I'm getting but, the sense, Linda, that we're in the middle of a serious UFO flap right now. I'm getting reports right and left, faxes, you name it. Before we go on, yeah. Linda, I've got to jump in. I said we're hurt all over the place. We've got a new station um, this evening, uh, I think number 128 for Dreamland. Oh, wonderful. It is KSTP AM, Saint, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota, 50,000 watts, covering a good part of the central part of the country. So I wanted to get that. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> right. And we also are sitting in a city where there is another 50,000 watt AM 1000 KOMO that's carrying Dreamland right now. You and bet. Um, this is uh, one of these areas where we're always getting reports from uh, lights to uh, abductions to animal mutilations to the possible Bigfoot scream screams that we were discussing a month ago. But this weekend, the subject that I think has captured everyone's imagination is what happened in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, and is there uh, a factual basis for for looking at the film that's going to be released uh, concerning the controversial Ray Santilli Merlin Productions purchased 16 millimeter 
film that we have discussed on Dreamland with Ray, uh, with everybody from Stanton Friedman to uh, many others, uh, including Dan Silver, who uh, saw that London screening. With me right now is George Wingfield, who is from England, was here and one hour ago presented to uh, the 500 and some MUFON assembly, assembly uh, approximately five black and white photographs of a being that is seen lying on some kind of a table. Uh, there is no hair. It is nude. Uh, the head is uh, much larger in proportion to a human head, but many other parts of this torso are human-like. There are six distinct fingers on the hands, and there are six distinct toes on the foot. Oh the eyes are larger. It, uh, these appear to be photographs from the autopsy. Now, having set this up, and that these black and white photos in the film are extremely controversial, I would like to now go to George Wingfield, who is with me right here, and who talked with Ray Santilli. Uh, in London uh, just last Tuesday about this film and what Ray Santilli is trying to do to prove whether or not it is actually film of an autopsy of a non-human being All taken right. from somewhere in New Mexico in 47. And with me now is George Wingfield. Hi. George, Hi, George. What would you right now say is the very best argument for the veracity of this film, given the fact that Congressman Schiff and possibly other congressmen have been being shown this St. Ray Santilli film as recently as the last two weeks in Washington. Well, there, there are several things about this film which are very curious indeed, and we have to consider very carefully. Uh, when, the, when the autopsy sequence was screened on May 5th in London, uh, Ray Santilli invited one of England's leading pathologists to view this and uh, give an opinion on what he saw. And people have um, denigrated Ray Santilli and said that he's a charlatan for nervous health. But uh, this only emerged later that he invited the pathologist along. And this doesn't strike me as being the action of a guilty man who's trying to put across a scam. Now, it's interesting to know what the pathologist actually thought of this film. Um, this autopsy sequence. Uh, first of all, he thought we're definitely dealing with uh, a dead body here. We're not dealing with any kind of a plastic dummy or a cleverly contrived Hollywood dummy or something of this kind made to look like an alien. Now, although it has a lot of human characteristics, it also does look very peculiar, as Linda has just uh, described. Um, the figure is about five foot tall, which is not you know, it is rather larger than we'd expect an alien prey to be, the traditional description. It has a large head, but it's not that large. It has very large eyes, which apparently had some kind of a dark membrane across them, which during the autopsy is scraped off into a bowl by the surgeon, who incidentally looks as if he's done this before. Um, there are various other features, like the, the six fingers and the six toes on each hand and foot. Um, it appears to be a female. There's no head hair or body hair at all. And the reason it appears to be a female is that there is something that looks like a vaginal opening? That's correct. Yes. Um, may, I, may I ask a question of both or either one of you? Um, is it uncommon uh, in human beings uh, for there to be six uh, fingers, six toes? Is that possible? It's possible. It's extremely rare. It's a condition... Uh, known as, um, well, let me think, polydactylism or polydactyly. Uh, it's extremely rare, but apparently um, sometimes you get a gene which sets in, so in certain tribes in some remote part of, I don't know, South America or uh, somewhere or other, you might find that this is much more common than it is in the world at large. I've never seen anyone with six fingers. But there was a Queen of England who had six fingers, that was Anne Boleyn, and she had six fingers on just one hand. But to have six fingers, six toes, all round, I think is extremely rare. Uh -huh. And another thing about this is that there are, apparently there are two autopsies you can see, and they show two similar but different creatures being autopsied. 
And again, uh, the other one has six fingers, six toes, and is entirely similar to the first one, but clearly a different creature. So, if this was um, if this is a hoax or some completely fraudulent footage, where on earth have the perpetrators uh, obtained these creatures? Uh, one suggestion, of course, is that um, maybe these are doctored corpses, and uh, somebody is um, maybe thrown on additional tickets or uh, altered the head by some kind of plastic surgery to look much larger than it should be and that this is otherwise a normal human corpse. The pathologist didn't think so. He saw no external signs of any doctoring of this kind. And when you see a close-up on the foot especially, Art, it is definitely like looking at a fully integrated foot, except there are six distinct toes. Linda, are these uh, uh, photographs of reasonable quality? They're very high quality, actually. Very the high two, quality. Well, George has two very good photographs that Ray Gentile gave him. Uh, of the foot and another of, I believe it was the head. We also have uh, what we were describing in the six photographs that were shown here at MUFON. They were actually taken from uh, apparently documentary footage that's being prepared by M4 in England, right? Oh, Channel, 4. Channel 4. Yes, in France, uh, Channel 4 in England for release, I believe, in August. And uh, this was a trailer for this upcoming film and uh, some enterprising person uh, videotaped and then put out in uh, the computer scanned images and that was part of what you were showed today. All right. Uh, it's beginning to sound a little exciting. Um, Linda, I know you. We've talked to you now for years. And I would like you to now break out a little bit and give me... I mean, you're sitting there looking at the photos. Right. I, I haven't. What is your assessment? Well, I am puzzled because, uh, as George said, I don't have the feeling that I'm looking at a mannequin. It does have the, uh, whatever one has, an intuitive sense of looking at something in photographs as we humans are used to looking at things. It does have at least uh, that intuitive sense of some kind of an actual body. Um, what I think I am especially struck by, my very first reaction was, this whatever it is, this humanoid does not look like a single drawing, a single description from the abduction literature, from so-called military and intelligence civilian weeks. Uh, the descriptions that have ranged from the small greys with the thin long arms to the taller greys to the so-called reptilian insect, right. tall humanoids that have hair or don't have hair. This is different and yet the eyes. Uh, George uh, saw clearly in the film in London that uh, the, uh, the surgeon lifted away from the two eyes a dark membrane, and those eyes are very large, and they would be considered to be a solid black, very large eye if you encountered them with the membrane. One interesting point, and George, you should address this. If I understand it, the surgeon seemed to lift out this membrane with such swiftness that it almost implied the surgeon may have already known that this was something that could be lifted off. It, it looked to me, he did, did it, um, each eyeball, uh, swift flick, and he'd remove that membrane which curled up into a dish of fluid. It looked to me as if he'd been doing this before. Uh, there, were, there were no false moves. Well, there's no way to know that this was the first, second, third, or fourth alien body they might have autopsied. Well, that's exactly. true. Exactly, Art. And one of the things that keeps coming to me is the uh, information of a variety that suggests that there were many other crashes that our government had been dealing with prior to 1947, that for some reason someone somewhere seems to be trying to draw the line at 1947, even though there's an increasing amount of information that things were happening before July, at least. And in this film, George, isn't it true that the date for this particular autopsy seems to uh, relate to a being that was uh, taken somewhere in June, not July. Well, uh, apparently, according to the, I can give you the whole story behind the film and where it purportedly came from, and uh, the man who entered Mr. Santilli is still in contact and has met on many occasions the cameraman who allegedly took this footage in, in New Mexico in 1947. And um, the story is similar to the Roswell story that we know, 
but it's different in several respects. Just to get back one moment to the to the corpse during the autopsy, I have a line here from the um, from the pathologist's report saying that um, what appeared to be the membrane covering the brain were shown being cut and the brain being removed. However, the appearances were not those of a human brain. This is England's leading pathologist speaking. And the color of the mask taken from the skull appeared very dark on the film where human uh, brain tissue would appear white. That's right. Gee, we, we seem to go um, up and down and up and down on this thing. First, uh, people seem to be leaning toward it as a fraud, but after listening to the two of you uh, this evening, it sounds like, well, it sounds like... We should it, keep an open mind, <laughs> Art. Yeah. Well, Yes, I, I can't say for certain that this is genuine, but uh, when I first saw it, I was extremely skeptical, and I had all sorts of objections and uh, misgivings about its origins and about Mr. Santilli himself, his company, his motives, this, that, and the other, several possible anachronisms in the film, like the phone hanging on the wall, I thought was probably not available in the 1940s. The curly phone cord. Is yes, there so any is. more news on that? Yes, it is definitely consistent with what military had to uh, available in the 40s. Curly phone cords were used. Okay, that's right. All right, well, that removes one large one. Plus, we've got to imagine that uh, it could be authentic film, um, and Mr. Santilli could be playing it for all it's worth, and frankly, an awful lot of people, if they had their hands on that film, would play it for all it's worth. So that doesn't surprise me. No. Uh, well, um, he certainly has uh, played it for all it's worth. I mean, he's got deals going now with Channel 4 television in, in Britain, and he's going to be showing a documentary which includes much of the footage in, in Britain, in France, Germany, and Italy, and I think he's quite pleased. He's in quite a good position financially now as regards what he paid out initially on the film, which is reported to have been uh, 100000 but at the same time, he is approaching experts to get their uh, verification about some things on this. He's right. certainly approaching experts. I mean, he doesn't seem to be afraid of the experts. He says, okay, I can't be 100% certain it's genuine, but I'm going to put it in front of the appropriate experts who can authenticate it and to verify that we are dealing with the right thing. All right, you do. I believe I do. Now, uh, the big question, uh, what about those photographs? Are they proprietary? Is there a chance you could get them to us? Could they appear on the Internet? Is there any way people can see them? Well, they are, they are in fact, on the Internet, and I'm not quite sure, um, not being very expert in these things, I'm not quite sure whereabouts on the Internet they are, but I'm not sure that um, Fox... Uh, haven't purchased copies of these five stills, and they probably have a page on the World Wide Web somewhere. This is um, all right. Uh, good television. enough. You two, hold on just a moment. I'll be right back to you. We all know that information is what it's all about, and for those of you who like looking over the edge, well, I've got some really hot news for you. It's called UFO Facts World Report, and it's a hot monthly newsletter packed with just the kind of information you've been looking for. The latest hard data on UFO sightings, encounters, abductions, and more. Gleaning information from around the country and around the world, UFO Facts newsletters put together by a staff of professional journalists. It's an easy ad to do North American trading. 1-800-877-9797. North American trading. All right. We've got a moment just before the bottom of the hour, and rather than go back to Seattle, I'll hold them through the break, and we'll go back to them and wrap this up. Let me take just one moment to again welcome our brand new affiliate, KSTP AM in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota, 50,000 big watts on 1,500. Now, also, we've got a bulletin board service up, and I wanted to let you know that we've got a lot of new stuff this weekend on the bulletin board. A lot of new goodies, so if you'd like to call our bulletin board, here is the number. Area code 702-727-1709. Once again, the bulletin board service with all the materials from Dreamland and Coast at 1, area code 702-727-1709. We'll be right back.
hour of Art Bell was recorded for rebroadcast at this time. Please do not call. Call Art Bell toll free. West of the Rockies at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies at 1-800-825-5033. 1-800-825-5033. Welcome back, everybody, to Dreamland. I am Art Bell. We'll get to the phone shortly. I think you ought to know who you're listening to, those of you who are new to the program. Linda Howe, worldwide, is, I think, generally acknowledged to be uh, the world's expert on crop circles and animal mutilations and things of that sort. And toward that end, just before we go back to her, uh, she has a lot of materials available. So uh, listen to this about Linda Howe. If you enjoy Dreamland's weekly news segments by Linda Moulton Howe, which features updates about mysterious phenomena, then you might want to know more about her books and documentaries. Linda Howe is an Emmy Award-winning television producer, writer, and researcher of Earth mysteries linked to non-human intelligences. Her books and videos provide scientific data and first-hand eyewitnesses. Linda Moulton Howe's two books, An Alien Harvest and Glimpses of Other Realities, are acclaimed for their quality, depth, photographs, and drawings. If you are interested in learning more about the mysterious animal mutilations, crop circles, UFO sightings, the human abduction syndrome, and government knowledge about these worldwide phenomena, you will enjoy these books and videos available directly from LMH Productions. You can dial 1-800-707-9993 to order. That's 1-800-707-9993. And now back to the lady herself. Linda, you there? Yes, I am, Art. Can you hear us? Uh, hear you just fine. All right. Well, uh, one of the things I think that George Wingfield and I would like to let the Dreamland the viewers know is that there is always a distinct possibility that the film and the photographs are a desperate effort on somebody's part to discredit Roswell. That's always been a possibility, and we've talked about that on Dreamland, and we have talked about the issue of why is it that anyone working for the United States government in 1947 on something as sensitive as an autopsy of a non-human being taken out of an unknown craft from someplace else in the universe, why would they ever be allowed to have any copies of any film? Uh, George Wingfield, who is with me, has talked with uh, Ray Santilli, who purchased this film, uh, about the photographer, and I think it's worth our hearing some comments. All right. Yeah, um, the, the photographer, the cameraman who took this footage back in 1947, supposedly, is absolutely key to this. And, uh, of course, he hasn't come forward into public view. Uh, we have an idea of um, what he's called, but I, I won't give a name. Uh, we know that he's roughly 80 years old, and he lives in the United States. And um, two years ago, he, wa he wanted to raise some money, and he offered this film to Mr. Santilli. The, second, the circumstances were rather peculiar. Um, Santilli was in the States uh, trying to purchase early footage of Elvis Presley film, uh, which he succeeded in doing from the very same man. And uh, this is the story we've heard. There's a lot of verification is needed here. This is all very recent, and I haven't even seen the Elvis footage, but I'm assured that that was purchased, and that is included in some segment of some uh, video or something which they they put out. Um, okay, so the cameraman, having sold the Elvis footage, which I stayed from about 1960, I would imagine, mm -hmm. um, calls up Santilli, who's still staying in his hotel near the airport, uh, wherever this is, uh, and says, I've got something else which might interest you. And he shows this uh, footage, it's not quite some footage, to Santelli, who, who is apparently amazed and says, well, what, what is all this about? And I simply don't understand. So Santelli is not a person who knows anything about UFOs or Roswell or anything. And when it gradually dawns on him that there is something of value here, is what he tells us, um, he determines he'll try to buy it. But negotiations take um, quite a time, over a year, and he hasn't got the money, and he has to borrow money from a colleague. 
and uh, eventually this leads up to the purchase in last November of the footage. And George, isn't it true that the photographer explained to Centilli that he had only bits and pieces that he had not given over to the military because he did not think the quality was high enough? That's correct. Um, the cameraman says that uh, he worked for the military in, in the 1940s. And in, in June of 1927, this is a month earlier than is generally supposed, he, he was called, he, he was sent from Washington, D.C. down to Roswell to take part in a clear-up operation, which was to clear up the debris of a um, crashed flying disc. And also, uh, this involved, he didn't know it at the time, it involved the recovery of alien bodies, which was subsequently autopsied uh, in a military hospital in Dallas, Texas. And um, he took several hours of um, film footage. 16-millimeter film. This is 16-millimeter film. He took probably five or six hours. And most of it, uh, he, he developed himself and submitted to his superiors, which is what they wanted. And uh, they got what they wanted, but there's quite a lot of footage left behind at the end of it. In fact, uh, about 90 minutes worth. So then this footage uh, that we now have is what was left over rather than extra copies that he made? That is what I understand. Uh, I hope I have that correct. I mean, I'm working on this the whole time, and I'm trying to uh, make sure that the story I'm being told is consistent and whenever, wh wherever I can I'm trying to check what I'm told or cross-check it with other people and cross-check it in some way. It's not always very easy, especially as I don't have access. All right, to well, I, I want to ask the, I want to ask the both of you a question now. Uh, obviously, these photographs have probably made the round at the MUFON conference up there, and there are a lot of experts. What is the general reception by others at MUFON? Very confused and puzzled. I would say that everyone from Michael Swords to others who either share a medical background or an academic background, at least uh, in the conversations with me, they have universally said this is extremely puzzling. If this was to be a, a so-called hoax, uh, why would the body that is being autopsied match what we've all been conditioned to see over the last 20 years? Years, these uh, gray uh, thin arm things. That's true. Uh, why is it that this first release of something that purports to be 16 millimeter film and photographs of a non human being from a crash disc and retrieval somewhere in the summer of 47, in this case it seems to be June, not July, why would it not look like anything that anybody else has ever described? This is very very puzzling if it is even supposed to be a hope. It is. All right. Well, we've got to go, but I want to thank both of you for the update. And uh, without having been at MUFON, you have given us the best word picture we could possibly have obtained. Thank this you. Thank definitely. you very much. Yeah, it's definitely the conversation. We left a panel discussion in which a whole bunch of us were in discussions, and we carried it right on into Dreamland. Excellent. Linda, thank you. Next week, uh, back home? Yeah, I'll be back in Philadelphia with a very interesting update on that Bigfoot scream story. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. I, in fact, I want to hear it again. All right, I will play it again. Right. <laughs> thank you both, and uh, and good night. Thank okay, you. Thank you, Art. All right, uh, there you've got it. There is the update from, uh, from the big uh, MUFON conference going on up in Seattle. Armed with new footage. Now, listen... All you web crawlers out there, if somebody manages to get uh, any of these photographs on the web, do one of two things, please. Either uh, upload them to our bulletin board system or send them to me. My email address, you can attach them to email and I'll get them to the board. Uh, my email address is uh, artbell at aol.com. That's artbell at aol. Dot com, Put no space between the art and the bell if you're elsewhere on the network uh, rather than on uh, um, AOL. All right, in a moment, Greg Long. Now, here's a man who has investigated, researched, and written about the UFO phenomenon for 19 years. He is, in fact, a field investigator for the Mutual UFO Network, or MUFON, and the J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies. Like many people of his generation, he grew up with the subject of UFOs. Throughout the 50s, 60s, UFOs were 
a regular staple of newspaper, TV, and radio accounts. Big one we joked about. Disappointed with the outcome of the Condon Committee's study of UFOs at the University of Boulder, Colorado in 1969, the UFO subject faded from his mind until 1975. Coming back from overseas after about two years, Long discovered there was a major flap of UFO sightings that had occurred while he was gone. So, renewed interest, Long began investigating and researching UFOs in earnest. In 1980, he interviewed Kenneth Arnold in Boise, Idaho. Arnold's sighting of nine UFOs over the Cascades in Washington State on June 24, 1947, was the seminal event that ushered in the modern era of UFO sightings. Shortly thereafter, Long focused on 20 years of documented UFO sightings and on, and we'll hear a lot about this, the Yakima Indian Reservation in Washington State. In 1990, the J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies published Long's study of those sightings. The book is examining the Earth Light Theory. The Yakima UFO Microcosm presents and analyzes nearly 200 UFO reports and accounts substantiated by photography and multiple witness observation. And by the way, in his book, he's got uh, quite a number of these photographs of what appear to be orange balls of light. I guess that's the only way I can put it. Accompanied, by the way, by sounds, which we have a short recording of. I think you're going to find that fascinating. And um, also, there is a relationship to earthquakes. All of that and more with Greg Long from, I believe, up in Oregon in just a moment. Many of you health-conscious folks know about antioxidants and their amazing health benefits. Vitamin C is probably the most famous of these. UCLA scientists found that antioxidant vitamin C can help avoid cancer, strokes, heart attacks, and increase life expectancy an average of five years. Well, now, there are new antioxidants on the market. Scientists say they're 20 times the power of vitamin C. And uh, they're private, can't pick them up on a scanner, no way. Uh, it's just so much white noise, and it's just uh, it, every aspect of this phone is better, except the price. It's not cheap, but good things rarely are. So if you're fed up with what you've got and you want a real portable telephone, I suggest you call Bob Crane at 7.30 in the morning at one 800 Five two two eight eight six three one eight hundred five two two eight eight six three. Let's find out where in Oregon um, a Greg is. Greg, uh, welcome to Dreamland. Good evening, Art. I'm glad to glad to hear your voice. Uh, good to be here. Um, uh, still, uh, I check on a daily basis, but I seem to still be here. Uh, Greg, uh, you have been researching. Primarily in one area, haven't you? Yeah, that's right. Um, and it involves when you say is you say orange UFOs is one way you put it. Are they orange uh, craft? Do you believe or orange uh, balls of light or energy or what do you think it is you're studying? Well, the, the way to answer that question is to step back and and look at the history of UFO sightings in the modern era and look at the amount of data that's been gathered over this near 50-year period. You know, currently the Center for UFO Studies has over 200,000 reports. Uh, the MUFON UFO network has uh, likely as many. Uh, and, of course, private investigators have their own files. And we sure. have files of information in, in other countries. There is a massive body of data to be analyzed. and. The UFO subject uh, is really very complex and varied, and if you look at the data, just if doing a broad survey, you'll notice that we have different shapes of objects. Um, not only objects that are lights, but objects that look like uh, craft, if you will, or technological uh, you know, machines. Yes. Um, 
What I'm interested in doing is taking one portion of this data and trying to find an answer to what that particular object might be. And in the body of literature, there is a consistent, a consistent pattern of observations and reports and photographs of an object that is described as a sphere or a ball of light. And I was very much attracted to pursuing this line of inquiry because of a number of sightings that I was aware of on the Yakima Indian Reservation. And the Indian Reservation uh, is located just to the east of the Cascade Mountains, actually at the foothills of the Cascade Mountains. And it was over those mountains that Kenneth Arnold did observe nine uh, objects on June 24th, uh, 1947. Kenneth Arnold was a pilot? He was a pilot. He was a private businessman that did his business by air. Uh, he was uh, selling and installing firefighting equipment in the Pacific Northwest. And on this particular day, uh, he was interested in trying to find a downed military transport uh, plane, uh, a C-47 that had crashed there on Mount Lanier. And on this particular day, uh, he was looking for it. There was a reward. I think it was a $500 reward. And he uh, happened to see these nine objects. Uh, of course, at that time, people did not have any concept of what flying saucers, as they were then called, uh, soon called, were. Uh, but he went ahead and reported what he saw as a, as a patriot patriotic American. And, of course, this created a tremendous sensation across the country and the world. Now, bear in mind, everybody, this is 19... 47, right? Yeah, that's right. This predates the Roswell events by uh, several weeks. Hmm. Um, but this area of the country, the Pacific Northwest, is very interesting because not only of Kenneth Arnold's sighting, but because of a tremendous wave of sightings that occurred uh, during that time period over the next uh, four to six weeks. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of sightings occurred up in this area and uh, were documented uh, very uh carefully by Ted Bloker in a book called The uh, UFO Report of 1947. Um, but at the foothills of the Cascades, there is the Yakima Indian Reservation. It's over a million um, uh, acres of land, which are held by the Yakimas and the Klickitats and some other Indian uh, tribes mm -hmm. since the Indian Wars of the 1840s. And I had moved to the Tri-Cities in eastern Washington and I read a newspaper report in 1978 about sightings that had been going on up there, and there were objects that were being photographed by the local fire control officer, Bill Vogel. Uh, and I decided that this was an opportunity to really dig into something that was close to home. It was in my own backyard. Sure. Uh, and so I went up and met Bill Vogel and began looking into his reports and looking at his photographs. And consistently what was being shown over and over again in his slides was this particular object, which was a sphere, uh, usually orange or reddish-orange in color. And uh, there were so many of these photographs that he had taken, and he was a very uh, solid, level-headed man. He was, uh, uh, as I said, the fire control officer. Uh, he was employed by the U.S. government and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And So, in uh, other words, he was, like, he was kind of up on top of a hill or a mountain uh, overlooking a large area of forest and looking for fires. I mean, that's why he was there, right? Well, that's right. What he had is he had a network of observers. Uh, actually, he was based down in Toppenish, which is uh, down there in the in the middle of the reservation. But his fire lookouts would travel up to a number of peaks, uh, 3,000 to 4,000, 5,000 foot high peaks, and these peaks overlook the Indian lands there. Much of the Indian reservation is uh, heavily forested, and, and of course, uh, during the summer, there's the tendency for, for fires in the Pacific Northwest due to the, the sure. timber and forest up here. Sure, and you've got a, a photograph of one of the stations. Uh, is it Sopia? Yeah, Sopelia, yeah, Sopelia Lookout Station, yeah. Right, so it was that kind of station where these photographs were taken. Well, one of the photographs was taken by a fire lookout for, from a Thetis Peak lookout station. It was a daylight photograph. I think you can see that in the book. Yes. Uh, there were other photographs that were taken actually on the valley floor there by Bill Vogel and also by uh, an electrical engineer from Seattle named David Akers. Uh, David Akers was uh, asked to go out to the reservation by J. Allen Hynek uh, and to actually do a stakeout or a, uh, a set up an observation post uh, at various places on the reservation and look for these things. And David Akers himself also managed to observe them and photograph them. So here we have photographs by actually three photographers. Uh, we had observations by David Akers, by Bill Vogel, by the fire lookout, uh, lookouts, and also by uh, ranchers and police there on the reservation. So it was evident to me 
uh, in looking at this uh, data on a preliminary basis along with Vogel that indeed there was something physically real here, uh, something that could be studied and analyzed. What did they think they were seeing? Well, they really had no idea. Uh, actually, a lot of these reports began filtering into Bill Vogel in the late 1960s. Um, he, when he first heard of the, these reports, he was a bit skeptical. Uh, but being an official and being responsible for uh, uh, his prior network, he had to certainly keep an open mind about it and, and record what he had been hearing. Uh, it wasn't until uh, September of 1971 when he was actually uh, patrolling, uh, looking for possible uh, fires after a lightning storm that he became, I guess, what you might call a believer because at that time he saw a teardrop-shaped object, a very bright luminescent object uh, with uh, what he called a rat's tail, which was hanging off the upper end of it, which uh, had flashing multicolored lights on it, and he succeeded in, in actually photographing it. Uh, and watched it slowly traverse uh, Highway 22 to the south over a period of about 30 minutes. And he concluded, because it was soundless and because of its shape, uh, that this was not any known aircraft or phenomenon that he was familiar with. So at that point, he became much more interested and much more open-minded about what his far lookouts were bringing to him as far as reports went. So all of this at this point, uh, with a number of reports and the photographs, and I've got them here in your book, uh, began to seem like something of substance. Yeah, that's right, exactly. And at that point, we will pick up the story when we come back from the news. We're going to break here at the top of the hour for the news. You're listening to a program um, which is a bit different. You'll discover that as it continues. It's called Greenland, Sunday evenings. I'm Mark Bell. We deal with topics that a lot of other people wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. And then again, that's why we do it. <laughs> we'll be right back. Good. Um, all right. Um, so from the original 47 sightings to the Indian Reservation to more investigation and more interest and photographs, and so where are we? Well, the the activity on the reservation that was uh, recorded by Bill Vogel and his far lookouts and others uh, was very, very intense during the 1970s. Uh, starting in the uh, late 1960s and picking up uh, uh, and, and increasing uh, through 1972, 1975, 76, UFOs became almost a nightly affair on the reservation. Uh, 
the, the amount of documentation that Bill Vogel has, which was uh, substantial, doesn't come to reflect uh, the number of sightings that were there. Uh, when I went up to the reservation uh, studying this year after year, I had so many leads to follow, I could never possibly pursue all of them. And in fact, uh, I once thought what I really needed was about a half a dozen researchers and a few, sure. a, a few full-time secretaries to keep track of it. There's something very unique, something very special about this, uh, this place in Washington State. Uh, the connection between Arnold sighting and these sightings, I'm not certain what it is beyond the fact that they were both very close uh, in geographic space. Um, but where we are today is activity still continues to go on there. I'm in contact with, a, with an investigator there now who's looking into some uh, current uh, sightings. But it's not as intense as it was. Now the question is why was it so intense and why has it tapered off? Uh, what I tried to do after amassing all this uh, evidence was try to find patterns and try to find some kind of theory, some kind of uh, hypothesis that we could test with the data as well as with physics to try to determine exactly what was going on. You know, your earlier question uh, that you posed to me uh, was, you know, are these balls of light a natural phenomenon or are they a technological device of some type? Right. Uh, so the tectonic strain theory of UFOs, which uh, is the theory that I test in this book, uh, was uh, something that I took a very close look at. And it's probably worth trying to explain that. Um, the Pacific Northwest is a is an earthquake-prone uh, part of the country. Uh, yes. I'm sure your listeners are familiar with uh, Mount St. Helens. Uh, Mount Rainier, Mount Adams, the whole Cascade Mountain Range is a result of, uh, of uh, major volcanic uh, activity uh, going back eons of, of time. Uh, and we're on what is called the Ring of Fire. Uh, and earthquakes are they're prevalent, prevalent up here. In fact, there's a lot of them that are beginning to occur in Oregon. There's more activity going on today than there was a few years ago. Doc, let me stop you there, Greg. I don't know if you have studied it, but I have several studies purporting to show that the number of six point plus earthquakes uh, over the last many decades has increased at an alarming rate an alarming rate and um, of course I've had Gordon Michael Scallion on and others who have talked about the earthquake uh, activity and what has occurred what they have predicted and what they uh, what has come true and there is a lot of activity going on there's also a current large UFO flop going on so oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. Oh yes, yes, and uh, and and the quake reports hit me daily. So, are you suggesting, and can you document a connection? Well, the tectonic strain theory of UFOs. Let's take a look at that, and uh, that, that way I can answer your question. Uh, as humans, what we really are are very very small uh, beings that live on uh, a thin crustal. Uh, uh, skin on planet Earth, and the Earth is 8,000 miles in diameter, and of those 8,000 miles, only 25 miles uh, of that distance is composed of what we really call the surface of the Earth, uh, the rock that we live on, and this rock is really composed of plates. These plates are moving under pressure caused by subterranean forces, by liquid magma, which is boiling beneath us. Uh, and when these plates move up against each other and slip suddenly, of course, we have an earthquake. Uh, the Yakima Indian Reservation, as it turns out, is actually heavily faulted. Um, there uh, are signs of earthquake activity going on there today, and there was uh, low-level earthquake activity going on during the 1970s. Mm -hmm. uh, Mount St. Helens is uh, about 180, 200 miles to the southwest. Uh, and again, we have the Cascade. So uh, I took a look at this theory, which, was, which has really been promulgated by Michael Persinger uh, in Canada and also supported by John Durr with the U.S. Geological Survey. And what it says is, is that in earthquake-prone areas, uh, there is a buildup of pressure that uh, is eliciting some kind of energy, which is ionizing the Earth's atmosphere above the surface of the Earth and forming uh, a ball. And then this ball can move and uh, appear to be intelligent in its activities as the energy uh, column or energy uh, stream beneath it moves along fault lines. All right, so you appear now to be arguing this is perhaps a natural phenomenon associated with uh, Earth or tectonic pressure. Well, that, that, that indeed is a possibility. What I've done since Yakima is I've extended my research out to look at data from 
uh, other sites, other uh, states and other countries around the world. And uh, I'm also digging back into into uh, decades of sightings, I'm going back to the 1940s and 50s and working my way back <laughs> to where we are today. Uh, and there are, are some clear indications that there are certain geographic areas where there, there is a clustering of earthquakes or, or earthquake faulting or uh, signs of uh, activity in the area and these lights. Now, one way to be able to prove that there is a connection between earthquakes and UFOs is to be able to have a database that's large enough to do that. Um, by pinpointing the geographic areas, we can go in and look at seismic activity that's gone on there over a spate of time. We can take a look at UFOs that have been sighted there and see if there's any direct correlations between them. Uh, Michael Persinger and John Durr have done that with Yakima. Uh, they feel that there is a strong statistical correlation, a preponderance of data that shows that uh, shortly before or after earthquakes, lights are seen, and it's very compelling. Uh, the problem is, is that mixed up with these balls of light on the Indian Reservation, there were also reports of Bigfoot. Uh, there were also reports of what appear to be abductions, as we understand them. Uh, there are also reports of encounters of humanoids, uh, and also beeping sounds and other kinds of strange noises. Uh, so All right, well, there, there's a good place uh, to tell me. I've got an uh, audio recording here, a short audio recording. How was this obtained? Uh, this is a recording that was made by a UFO researcher named David Jacobson. Uh, and in April of 1975, April 19th actually, he recorded this on the Tulalip Indian Reservation, which is just above Seattle in the Puget Sound area. Uh, I don't know all the details about it, uh, except that there was something that was being heard up there. Uh, many years earlier, I think it was 1966 in Hoopdall, Washington, there was a similar beeping sound that was heard that skeptics uh, uh, interpreted as being the sound of a soft, wet owl. Um, but he had recorded these, and actually Bill Vogel had this recording and provided it to me. Since this recording, I have been in touch with another researcher who has acquired other recordings from other independent investigators yes. and has had them all analyzed and has shown clearly that it's not an owl. Uh, they do share uh, the same uh, uh, frequency band and uh, similarities, and they seem to be the same sound. Now, the, the interesting thing about this particular tape that you have is that it was recorded in April of 1975, and at the same time, in the same month, on the Yakima Indian Reservation, which would have been uh, several hundred miles to the east, uh, Bill Vogel was receiving uh, reports of beeping sounds. And, in fact, I interviewed a witness on the reservation who himself had heard these. I found this extremely interesting uh, because here we have independent witnesses. We had a recording. And then most recently, as I mentioned, there have been some other recordings that have surfaced of the same, of the same sound. So All right. it is, All it right, is but real. Yes, but it appears to be associated with something that he's seeing. I mean, clearly from what he said, he was seeing an, he said an, an object. Well, that, uh, I don't, I'm not certain whether he really saw an object, Art. I, uh, I think he might have only gotten part of the narrative. He was attempting to find an object. It was located somewhere above him in the trees. Um, they, they attempted to see it, but I don't believe actually they ever saw it. All right, let's play it. Let's uh, let w the audience decide for themselves. It is an odd beeping sound. Uh, the audio level was very low. I hope you'll be able to hear it. Um, here is the sound. is quite close by, he said, and the compass is steady. So you're right, he didn't really say that he was seeing an object. That's right. He was assuming that there was an object. Now let me just take a brief moment, if I could, Art. I, I went through my files and I pulled out some representative samples uh, of newspaper stories that were being published in the early 1970s around the country, which uh, interestingly were reporting beeping sounds which were associated with objects. Uh, here's one dated July 17, 1972, uh, Elliott Lake, Ontario. Uh, this is from the Espanola Standard, Ontario, Canada. 
Uh, three girls here uh, heard a loud humming noise with an intermit intermittent beeping sound coming from the area uh, over the high school. They also heard what sounded like magnified voices coming from something behind the high school. Uh, they then saw a giant red ball about the size of a full moon, which is quite interesting. Uh, here's another, another report from uh, the News American of Baltimore, Maryland, uh, dated August 30th, 1972. Uh, on August 14, 1972, a young man named Greg Faltersack told police that he was driving along a country road. Uh, he was surrounded by mist and woods when he saw something. Uh, at that moment, the electrical system in his uh, Plymouth went out, uh, and he heard uh, a strange beeping noise. Hmm. Uh, here's another report from Centralia, Washington. This is uh, March 18, 1971. June Wadsworth uh, observed a UFO in the sky. It had multicolored red and green blinking lights and was emitting a strange beeping sound. I have numerous accounts here. I probably have at least a, a two dozen of these. And it's clear to me that in some cases there is an object associated with it, and in many cases it is a ball of light. So there seems to be something rather intriguing here that, that perhaps balls of light are emitting a beeping sound. Uh, they do affect automobile engines. Uh, they do affect animals in some cases. All right, uh, that, that, that would suggest a large electromagnetic field to affect an automobile. Simple yeah, well, that's true. That's true. Um, so... Uh, on the other hand, that would not necessarily be out of line with something that would be produced by pressure, I suppose, from the Earth. Gee, this is all uh, this is all guesswork. There are a lot of people talking about beings of light. I'm sure you've heard that phrase a million times. Any any connection? Do you think? Well, you know, there's another report that I should mention to you, and it's the Interrupted Journey by John Fuller which uh, is an interesting chronicle of Betty and Barney Hill's, you know, famous abduction case. Oh, yes. You know, I, I in, in preparing for your show, I went back and, and looked in here, uh, and on uh, page 123, there is uh, the transcripts of the, uh, of the interviews uh, that were held with uh, Betty and Barney Hill, and at the close of their uh, experience, uh, when they left the scene, they saw a bright, huge ball which was orange, I'm quoting it right here, it was a bright huge ball orange, it was a beautiful bright ball, and as they were driving away, they heard a beeping sound, uh, which seemed to be coming from behind their automobile. Um, so it may be that the you know, beeping sounds are being emitted by balls of light, which are craft, which are carrying beings. So. Uh, the problem is putting all these pieces together, and the only way to do it is to go to particular areas like Yakima or uh, be able to gather enough data from disparate locations uh, from independent observers. Well, you've given us a lot of evidence suggesting both natural and unnatural. Um, you're the guy who has studied this for so long. What is your best guess? Well, my best guess is that we that we really don't have an answer, right? I mean, I, uh, I, I I think that it's worth testing uh, testing the tectonic strain theory of U UFOs further. Uh, that's my specific goal. I now have amassed thousands of reports from newspaper sources and from investigators' files and articles. There's enough data now that we can uh, look at these cluster areas and look at the seismic records and see if we can see a direct correlation in time with objects uh, and with earthquakes. Michael Persinger's work is very, very compelling and very interesting. Uh, the problem is with Yakima, he never really showed any direct correspondence in time between an earthquake and a ball of light. That is, when an earthquake occurs, there should be a ball of light. Well, he never found that. He found an interesting pattern in which balls of light would appear about six months after a, a low-level earthquake. They never could match the two together. All right, Greg, hold it right there. We'll be right back with you. I know there will be a lot of people who will have reports for you, people who have seen balls of light or even beings of light, because we have had many, many, many such reports. So it is an interesting area to look into. And we'll do more of it in a moment. You may think your home's your castle, but not if you've got home. with George Wingfield, who was on earlier with uh, Linda Moulton Howe. 
I know that he has some reports of balls of light and associated with those. Uh, there are some news clippings I have from several years ago in which observers had reported some uh, some orange balls of light. Uh, that's fascinating. There may be something going on there. That sort of opens a Pandora's box now. Uh, not only do we have earthquakes, but we have uh, sometimes the Bigfoot associated with ball of light sightings. We have abductions, and now we have corn uh, crop circles. So Bigfoot fascinates me. I've never been able to find an expert uh, to have on the program and talk about Bigfoot. Maybe you can fill us in a little bit. Let's go to the phones again. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Greg Long. Hi. Yes. Uh, Where are you, sir? I'm in Lexington, Kentucky. All right. Um, it, it's interesting that you happened to mention Bigfoot because that was what my question was about. Good. Um, something that had occurred to me, and I'll try to make this brief, um, but you said there's been an association with Bigfoot and UFOs. Uh, I've also heard in the literature that there's an association between uh, UFOs uh, and aliens. Uh, genetically altering human beings through the course of history. Uh, what I'm wondering is you might pose to this guest and some of your other guests in the future if they've ever considered that uh, the human race uh, where it would have been say, thousands of years ago is what Bigfoot is today and we're the new improved version. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, we're on uh, Bigfoot, so let's stay there for a moment. Are we an improved version of Bigfoot? Is he some sort of relic of what we once were, or what? Well, that's uh, that's good beyond me. I'm not uh, I'm not an anthropologist. Uh, you know, Bigfoot uh, up here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, uh, it has been observed Bigfoot in areas where UFOs have been seen. You know, on, on, at Yakima, for example. I know Estacada, Oregon, which is east of. Uh, of Portland, there have been sightings of UFOs as well as Bigfoot sightings too. Um, Bigfoot was also heavily reported in Pennsylvania in the 1970s. Hmm. And, and that Bigfoot, though, was a much different variety. It had fangs and glowing red eyes and hmm. extremely vicious and a very violent uh, creature. And it was observed in Rome, Ohio, for example, in uh, Dennis Polichus, who I'm, I'm not sure if he's active in the field anymore, but he had. Uh, uh, he had documented right in his hometown sightings of this Bigfoot creature and UFOs that were uh, uh, operating over a, uh, a farmer's pro uh, farmer's property there. Um, you like sounds, Gray. I'll tell you, Linda Moulton Howe, did you happen to hear, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, she had the sound of something that sounded horrible. I mean, it raised the hair on the back of your neck. We're going we're gonna to hear it again next week. And it was it certainly could have been like the creature you just described it sounded off no, I'd, I'd love to hear that you know i have a recording as well that i might uh, send you art um uh i'll just send it to you later it's also a bigfoot cry up in uh, sonomish uh, washington uh, sonomish has historically been a very active area for for bigfoot uh but the answer to your caller's question about whether bigfoot is uh or whether we are a, what a successful genetic experiment i guess you might say sure uh, i really don't know how to answer that answer that grover Krantz uh is someone you might want to invite here on your show he's uh been studying bigfoot for 20 years uh he is an anthropologist at uh, washington state university ah. and has published a book called bigfoot prints and uh has done an excellent job in looking at plaster casts and hair samples and all the data that he has managed to gather over the last Oh, he would years. be very interesting. Uh, can you get me contact information for him? Uh, sure I can. I, I certainly was glad to do that. Uh, there are some other people who will give me some time to think about it that I can mention to you as well you might want to invite uh, on your show to cover that subject. I'm always interested, and we're in a constant search for uh, good people in these areas. You're the first one I've ever had, uh, Greg, that has researched balls of light for as long as you have. Um, and as I said, if this morphing business is accurate, then it's horrendously frustrating. It must be uh, for you to even consider such a thing. Greg, we're at the uh, top of the hour. So just relax. We'll be back in about five minutes. Okay. All right. Greg Long is my guest, investigator, author, and there is more to come on Dreamland. The Alpine air purification. Oh, back to the phones very quickly. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Greg Long. Hi. 
Hi, how you doing? Okay, where are you? Uh, my name is Jim, and I'm in Mesa, Arizona. All right, Jim. I have two things relating to, I guess, the balls of light. Uh, one, one was an instance where my wife and I and a friend of ours were driving in a car on Interstate 40, uh, like 2 in the morning, mm -hmm. and there was no other cars on the road. We were in, uh, in the desert in California approaching Arizona, Yes. and we seen up ahead what we thought was uh, a truck coming the other direction on the highway, and when we got closer, it wasn't a truck, it was just one big light hovering over the highway. Uh, it hadn't, it just, just was a round globe of bright light where you had to squint your eyes. And it got to the point where we had to stop the car to a dead stop, and then it just blinked out and disappeared. The light had taken up three lanes of the highway. It was just hovering in the air. It, was, it wasn't moving any of and it was in the desert. There was no buildings or any reflections. Interesting. You would say that. You say it just poofed out? It just blanked out. Just blanked out. All right. Um, yes, that is, that inter is interesting, Art, because uh, the balls of light that were observed on the Yakima Indian Reservation were either hovering or moving slowly and typically went out like a light switch being thrown. All right. Let me read you this uh, from Vincent in Kent, Washington. Art, I lived in Yakima, 1973 to 83. I operated the city of Yakima Senior Center from 73 to 75. Some of the old timers told me about these balls of light. The ones who saw them thought they were balls of flames. Sometimes they would float over north, uh, float north over, I believe it's... Uh, Antonym Ridge from the reservation Antietam, to yeah. Antietam Ridge uh, from the reservation to the city of Yakima. Some said they saw them bounce on the ground and some just went poof and they went out like a candle going out. Some thought they uh, even started fires. That's Vince in Kent. Well, that's very interesting. I hope I can uh, hope I can talk to Vince. I'd like to know more about what he knows. Well, Toward that end, uh, I try to allow my guests to always do this, um, the ones who don't pipe up first. I know you've got a book, and so tell them how to get your book, and if you would like. Now, I, I caution my guests, because <laughs> there's a lot of people out there, Greg. I know. Um, if you would like to supply a phone number or an address for people to contact you, uh, you are welcome to do so. Well, let me do that, and I'll, uh, I'll take what happens. Uh... Uh, if anyone's interested in buying, examining the Earth-like theory, it uh, does cost $19.95, uh, and uh, you can purchase it from the Center for UFO Studies. Uh, the address is 2457 West Peterson Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60659. I'll repeat that one more time. All right. Uh, Center for UFO Studies, it's 1995. Uh, for the book. Uh, the address is 2457 West Peterson Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60659. All right. And I would like to hear from people. Uh, I'll give you give your listeners my address and phone number. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, uh, but I'm looking for data, and I'm, I'm sure there's people out there who have observed these things and perhaps even photographed them. That's right. Uh, my address is P.O. Box. 819 Philomath, Oregon, and that's spelled P H I L O M A T H, Philomath, Oregon, 97370. I'll repeat it one more time P.O. Box 819 Philomath, Oregon, spelled P H I L O M A T H. Mm -hmm. Uh, Oregon 97370. My phone number is area 503-929-3557. I'll repeat it one last time. Uh, area 503-929-3557. All right. Well, that ought to do it. Uh, good luck. I hope you like being on the phone. <laughs> I hope I can get some sleep. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Greg Long. Hi. Hi, I'm in Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Yes, yes sir. sir. I lived in North Carolina back in the 80s, and there was a, 
I think, fairly well-known legend or set of stories about lights that dance through the hills and hollows in some part of the Piedmont or uh, the Appalachians. I wonder if you're familiar with that. Well, um, I am familiar with uh, spook lights and ghost lights. Uh, a lot of those reports, which are of uh, small balls of light, in this case we're talking about several inches to maybe a few feet in diameter, uh, are reported from the Appalachian or uh, middle southern, I guess, area of the, of the state, as well as the Midwest, parts of the Midwest. Uh, I can't pinpoint exact areas. Uh, brown, there, there are the brown mountain lights, I believe, in North Carolina, which is a famous uh, locale for observations of these kinds of lights. Uh, but there's a long, uh, extensive body of literature on what are called spook lights or ghost lights, uh, which uh, have some connection to folklore, uh, although I'm not really convinced that it has anything to do with myth or legend. I think they are real. Uh, but typically they are small and they are uh, often white uh, in color or bluish or, again, orange in color. But they don't seem to be related to the kind of things we're talking about here. Well, they very well may be. You know, if uh, now, when I got into the subject, um, I, I wrote to the U.S. Geological Survey and I said, give me all you know about earthquake faults in the United States. I got a map that's about four feet by two and a half feet uh, in, the, in, the, in dimensions. And the United States, remarkably, is very, very heavily faulted. The only area of the United States that is not uh, filled with faults is the upper Midwest portion of the United States. The Appalachians and the eastern seaboard are heavily faulted, and I wouldn't be surprised if some of these things that are being observed in those areas are related to Earth lights. Well, and, you know, keep in mind, of course, that much of the uh, seismic activity in the last couple of hundred years, you know, New Madrid, uh, Charleston, you know, there have been some major quake faults up in, in the New England area, too, like you say. Uh, much of what we see or have seen in, in recent history has been on the West Coast, but there's been a lot of that kind of activity. There was recent activity in New England. There was recent activity in all, uh, of all places in South Dakota. Oh, is that right? Yes. So um, there is, um, thank you, there's all kinds of earthquake uh, activity going on. And there are a lot of people, and I don't know what weight you give to this, uh, Greg, but there are a lot of people out there who feel something is getting ready to happen. That's a very, I know it's yeah. a very vague statement, but believe me, there are a lot of people that feel it. Well, you know, there are a lot of uh, precursors to earthquakes, and I'm sure you're familiar with what the Chinese are doing, using animals, uh, fish in aquaria, and uh, birds and small animals, uh, in which uh, the Chinese have... Uh, uh, small armies, if you will, of people who do nothing but uh, watch these animals' behavior. And uh, often before major earthquakes, these animals will become uh, uh, frightened and frenzied and run around their cages and squawk and scream and everything else. And uh, it's not beyond uh, comprehension that people have some sensitivity to changes in uh, electromagnetic fields and vibrations in the earth and that kind of thing. You're darn right. I happen to believe that, for one. Uh, it is interesting the balls of light appear seemingly appear after an earthquake and not before, so they, they're not of much predictive value, apparently. Well, there, you know, the tectonic strain theory does call for the appearance of these before and after earthquakes. Oh, before as well. Oh, yeah, before and after them as well. Uh, I guess I should have qualified that earlier. It, it's, a, it's a lag time of about six to nine months, typically, which is what Persinger is talking about where these balls of light will be observed and then there is an earthquake. We do know that there are, are earthquake lights, and this is well documented. There was a, uh, a flurry of earthquake activity in Japan in the 1960s, and a number of photographs were taken of uh, glows of light which were uh, emanating from the, the, the surface of the Earth. These were typically described as being uh, uh, like an overturned bowl or a uh, half circle of light. Uh, there's been a lot of literature that's been compiled over the last uh, 50 or 60 years, uh, there is uh, a researcher that was named uh, Gali in Italy who compiled a large catalog of, of uh, observations of ball of light and, and luminescent kind of phenomena in Italy, which also is earthquake prone. All right, um, back to east of the Rockies. You're on the air with Greg Long. Hi. Hello. Hello there. Um, I'm Anna from uh, Springfield in Ohio. Uh, well, I saw one of those orange balls about 12, 15 years ago, I don't recall. It was a, I, I couldn't sleep one night. I woke up out of a dead sleep. 
And I come downstairs and was mad because I couldn't sleep. Had more milk, went back upstairs and sat on a bed. And I didn't have curtains up on my back side of my window. And I saw this orange ball come real slow and then it stopped and it just went down to the ground. There's a lake behind our home. And one night I had one of those little gray guys standing by my bed. And I just swung at it and told her to get the hell out of here and it went. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, the ball of light again, Art, uh, you know, we're trying to unravel this mystery of what's causing them. Uh, yes. As I said earlier, there seems to be an association uh, between balls of light and the so-called encounter uh, report. Uh, you know, Ed Conroy, I was, again, looking through some of the literature, it's such a mass of this, but uh, Ed Conroy worked for uh, the San Antonio Express and wrote a book called Report on Communion, in which he looked at Whitley Strieber's uh, accounts to try to provide validity for them, and he himself saw on street, the Strieber's property when he was invited out there, uh, a ball of light which was moving in an undulating fashion. It had the apparent size of a golf ball and moved just above the uh, the trees. Uh, so there seemed to be some uh, some compelling uh, connection between balls of light and uh, and aliens, if you will, or the abduction scenario, what have you. All right, let's hold it right there for a second. Uh, Greg Long is my guest. I kind of like that lady's idea. Some of the rest of you might bear it in mind. Ever faced with a, a gray or an alien face to face? She told it to get the hell out of here, and it did. That's probably worth remembering. North American Trading has done a very wide, um, uh, wonderful program. Thank you. Uh, I have never seen an alien or ever. I, just, I, I love your program. I got hooked on this. I'm only 15. Well, I've never seen an alien either, so don't worry about it. Huh never seen anything. I, I did one day see a small ball of light a couple miles from my home. Oh? Uh, floating mm, just above the treetops. It was very tiny. You know, the only problem with uh, balls of light in Florida and parts of the south is that the scientists are so easily able to say, swamp gas. Is that not true, Greg? Well, that's true, but you know, if you look at really what swamp gas is, uh, it's a very diffuse uh, 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 chemo-luminescent uh, phenomenon. It, it tends to be very diffuse and, uh, and hazy and fuzzy. So what did you see, sir? Was it a distinct... Uh, describe it. Oh, well, it was uh, just... Well, if I looked out my window, it was just right above the treetop. And, well, I live uh, very close to the water, so we couldn't have been swamp gas because I was uh, not far from the ocean. And it was, well... It looked very far away. It was a really tiny, small ball of light, and it was just a, it wasn't pulsing or flash. It was just solid light. And then did it disappear, fly away, or how did it, uh, or did you just get tired of watching it? Uh, well, I just kept watching it. Suddenly just, it moved a little to the left, uh, did a little small triangular pattern, and then took off to the south. Took off. Hmm. All right. Uh, thank you. See, um, that... That sounds like a craft to me. That, that sounds much more like something capable of uh, its own movement. Yeah, that's true. Uh, again, that's why it's important to look at all these uh, reports in, in the finer details, because some of these balls of light that are simply hovering in one place and going out, again, they suggest uh, an energy uh, being depleted, and now with the energy gone, the light form is going to vanish. Yes. But objects that are hovering and then shooting off at uh, high speed or in some direction, an angle up to the atmosphere, I don't think that can be accounted for by uh, an electromagnetic beam or a column or something like that. All right, back again for a second to the earthquakes, because I have a question. How deep is your database of information to suggest a correlation uh, between the two? Well, it, it's deep in the respect that uh, there are many cases where these balls of light or, or other lights, uh, again, they, uh, balls of light are really the, uh, the, the signature that you're looking for in correlating lights with, uh, with earthquakes. But in some cases, I have flashes of light and sparkles and, and bursts of light and that kind of thing. But uh, there is an interesting pattern where many of these balls of light are seen around mountains. And, you know, mountains are caused by the upthrusting of rock from, from the earth. And that upthrusting is caused by plates that are moving one against the other one. Uh, so if you look at 
particular geographic areas and look at the landscape, look at the topography, and look at what is being observed there. There is, on the face of it at least, a correlation, but the work has to be done in terms of going into the seismic database and looking at actual earthquake activity and looking at the appearance of the lights and when they happen. All right, that, hasn't been, that hasn't been done yet. All right, good. Um, thank you. Uh, Greg Long is my guest. He'll be back in just a moment next week on Dreamland. Dr. James Lewis, author of The New Encyclopedia of Afterlife Beliefs and Phenomena. That should be uh, very interesting. Next week on Dreamland, don't forget our bulletin board number, area code 702-727-1709, 24 hours a day. You with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-TALK. First time callers, area code 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Or the wildcard line at area code 702-727-1295. 727-1295 in the 702 area code. Now again, here's Art Bell. Thank you, and uh, welcome back. Greg Long is my guest. For 19 years, he's been researching balls of light. And uh, it's it's almost hard for me to imagine somebody spending that number of years uh, on it, and yet so many have seen them. So many of you have seen them uh, that I well maybe I can understand it. At any rate, back to him and a bunch of faxes here in a moment. Uh, the Sea Crane Company has got GE Super Three radios in, and I'll tell you uh, the Super series of GE threes. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole history, but uh, they are the most sensitive uh, front-end AM radios uh, that I think are sold any anywhere. They're just absolutely incredible. The GE3, when it first came out, was a big disappointment. Everybody went, wow. We thought it would be an improvement over the other great GE series, and it wasn't. Well, they got recalled, and whatever was wrong, they fixed it. And it is truly super. It's a portable. It uh, operates on uh, batteries, D cells, um, just like the old Zenith uh, Transoceanic. Or you can plug it into the wall, and it comes with a plug actually attached to go right into the wall. It's got a large speaker, so the AM reproduction is superb. It's got um, um, a large ferrite antenna, and I guess that's part of the reason it does so well on AM. And, of course, these sell out immediately. And I mean immediately. So if you want one, you must be on the phone early in the morning, Monday morning. I doubt they'll be, I bet they're all sold out by, oh, I don't know, 11 o'clock. No later then. They're $59.95. And I'll tell you something, Bob Crane, I don't think he makes very much on these, or maybe he doesn't make anything at all. The reason we sell them is because we want you to have good AM reception. Actually, he better make a couple bucks on them, but I'll tell you, it's not, it's not, certainly not much. This is near rock bottom, $59.95. If you want one, uh, and the phones are busy, try back after 10 a.m., but I'll tell you, get on it at 7.30 Pacific Time, 1-800-522-8863. 1-800-522-8863. Hope you have that number written down. All right, back to Greg Long. Greg, are you there? Yes, I'm still here. Art, I grew up in Yakima. My dad, who was 56 years old when I was born, mentioned seeing these balls of light several times while hunting the lower valley well before I was born in 1949. He thought little of them. He simply referred to them as lightning balls. No big de deal to him or his hunting buddies. So apparently a lot of people have seen these, but uh, lightning balls, um, again, that requires lightning, doesn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we'd have to know what the weather conditions were at the time that this uh, his father saw these. Uh, you'd have to have lightning to have ball lightning. So uh, if, if the weather is clear, there has to be some other explanation. All right. Another one. I've been listening to your guest, Greg, tonight, and it reminds me of a recent experience which may not be related. About two months ago, 
I had a photograph taken of my aura, which showed, interestingly enough, an orange ball of light above my aura. The photographer stated, um, uh, so he's got this photograph and is willing to supply it. He may upload it to my bulletin board service, I hope so, um, which is open 24 hours a day. Uh, don't remove your face, uh, Pete. He says he's going to remove his face. That would take away from it. It's area code 702-727-1709, open 24 hours a day. So you're also welcome, by the way, Greg. Are you uh, on computers in the Internet, that sort of thing? Well, I'm not yet. I, I want to be. Well, I highly recommend it, uh, and I think you'll find that... Um, you know, your ability to reach out and investigate will really be enhanced. Yeah, that's right. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Greg Long. Hi. Well, hello. That was quick. Well, good. Uh, where are you? This is Dorothy calling from uh, Liberal, Kansas. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have three things to discuss. Uh, number one, uh, approximately a year ago, July or August, uh, New Lenox, Illinois, man and his wife coming home. He is a scientist with a major government installation. Uh, it had started to rain. They had just come over a railroad track, and they saw a blue light following them. They thought it was the police car coming up on them, so he slowed down because he thought he was speeding. And it um, caught up with them and came into the car and went nowhere. It just lit up the car, but it was a big blue ball of light. <laughs> now, it was raining. They came on to where I was. They said they had come directly there. The lights were off because there had been um, a noise of explosion or something that it hit a power transformer. Now, they thought they had come directly, which I wasn't more than four minutes away from where they were, but there was a good half hour to 45 minute time lapse from the time that blue light was in their car to the time they got to the house. Mm, that's interesting. But they didn't know if it, uh, what they did was ball lightning. Is it blue? This had followed them down the highway. Well, there is a problem with something following an automobile. Uh, typically, uh, ball lightning appears to be attracted to some metallic objects when they enter homes, and they, they usually explode with a very loud report. Uh, in fact, they've been known to kill people when they explode. Um, there are accounts in the UFO literature of balls that do follow automobiles for miles and miles. Mm -hmm. uh, the, we've, we've got a problem here, though, with, uh, with the weather. Uh, certainly it's possible for ball light to enter into an automobile if there is some kind of crack uh, between the window and the door or that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. uh, it had to be researched more. The, the loss of time, that fits the missing time uh, phenomenon in uh, with abductions. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, perhaps there's the automobile. Mm -hmm. uh, although uh, if they were driving and lost consciousness for 30 minutes, I would tend to think they would have driven off the road. So. Well, they thought they had, uh, that they had just continued on their way, but when I reminded them when the, the electric went off, there had been a good half hour to 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, Greg, are there uh, a lot of uh, reports of disruptions of vehicles, uh, operation, in other words, engines stopping, that sort of thing, associated with the appearance of the balls? You know, Mark Rodiger, who is the scientific director of the Center for UFO Studies, looked at that very question about uh, vehicle interference, and he took a database of several hundred reports and looked at correlations between UFOs and car stoppages, you know, engines going out and yes, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Right. Uh, but he did notice that there was a subset of ball of light uh, phenomena that seemed to be associated with that, but the pre preponderance of, of car stoppages really were more structured-looking objects. It's interesting uh, because, uh, Greg, I've been hearing reports lately that scientists have actually developed some sort of uh, device that can produce an EMF type pulse that can stop a car. I mean, they're doing research so that, uh, you know, police, in, instead of having a high speed car chase, can point this at a car and stop the engine. So, you know, it's, it's not outrageous, apparently, that there would be this sort of energy possible. No, certainly. There's a famous case called the Val Johnson case in which a, uh, a sheriff's deputy in, um, I think it was Minnesota or Michigan, in the, uh, in the late 1970s uh, 
saw a ball of light which was suspended over a highway and this thing came hurtling at him and hit struck his automobile and he became unconscious for a period of time and the car was studied by the center of UFO studies working with General Motors and they looked at the windshield and a bent antenna and uh, chips of paint that were burned off of the uh, of the car and that kind of thing and it certainly is possible that you can generate uh, some kind of ball or or beam of energy and disable uh, you know engines and people hmm. That's it's, that's really something. I suppose that ball lightning, though, would have a great deal of EMF energy contained in it, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. <laughs> so, boy, who knows. Um, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with Greg Long. Hi. Hi. Turn your radio off, if you would, for us, please, and tell us where you're calling from. Columbia, Missouri. Columbia, Missouri, all right. Yes, uh, first of all, I want to say a great show. Uh, is there some way I can get hold of the uh, theme music you use? Oh, uh, yeah, it's uh, Ray Lynch. It's uh, Ray Lynch does it. It's called the O of Pleasure. Like O-H, O of Pleasure. Ooh. Okay. All right. Uh, question for Greg Long. Yes. Or not a question. Um, you were talking about... Uh, Ghost lights. Uh, back in the late 50s, down around Carthage, Joplin, Missouri, they had uh, some ghost lights out in the hinterlands. Even had a little uh, telescope set up. You can put a quarter in and uh, view them. And we had a kid there in high school named Bill Underwood who uh, made that his science project, and he studied them and used uh, very powerful uh, refractive uh, optics and resolved the images of the ghost lights, and it turned out that they were uh, made by headlights on a highway some miles away. Um, yeah, I'm familiar with that study. Uh, the Marfa lights in Texas, uh, people have been looking at those as well and, um, and are looking at the idea that uh, headlights are actually being observed uh, at some distance and being distorted through haze or, or simply distance and uh, are, re are being resolved with the human eye as balls of light. So uh, there are some explanations for these things. Well, uh, that might not explain, explain everything. Excuse me? That might not explain everything, but, uh, you know. I... No, it, it would tend to explain some of these that, that tend to to hover always over the same location uh, and don't seem to ever be seen anywhere else, and it tends to suggest that there must be something that's repeating over and over again there. Uh, a question. Um, if you were to compile and look at your database, how, what percentage of the reports would you classify as resolvable by natural phenomena? Well, you know, Art, the problem with that is not being able to do the seismic uh, the seismic correlations yet. Um, there is, a, a, I guess, a fairly significant number of these uh, objects that are reported that suggest to me something natural in respect that they are very short-lived. Uh, they tend to uh, move up from the ground. For example, they look like they're coming up from behind the tree or, or a promontory or a ridge or something. Mm -hmm. They hover for a period of time and they go out. Uh, they aren't doing anything that you would associate with intelligent maneuver or surveillance or moving toward people or that kind of thing. Uh, the ones that follow automobiles for a period of time, the ones that um, uh, are dividing and merging together and entering other objects, I have some cases where, where balls of light are ejected from other objects exactly. uh, and uh, descend to the ground or move toward the observer. You know, that's another question. I do think that there is a probably a fairly significant body of UFO reports uh, that are in the ball of light category that ultimately will be explained as being natural. Uh, the problem, though, as we've mentioned throughout the show, is uh, balls of light that are associated with uh, craft-like objects or abductions or close encounters and that kind of thing. All right, Greg, uh, stand by. We'll be right back to you. I saw one craft, ladies and gentlemen, one. It was silent, triangular, about 150 feet above me. There was no mistaking it, what it was. It was not a ball of light. It was a solid, uh, very solid, uh, very large object, not flying, but floating. I was in the Air Force. I know what it takes for aerodynamic uh, flight. So while there are balls of light, there are also craft, unmistakable craft, and there are a lot of mysteries up there, many of them simply not explainable totally inexplicable and uh, that is why we do 
this program trying to get to the root of it. We'll be right back. You may think your home's your castle, but not if you've got hard water. If you've got shower heads coated with that icky white scale, you're trapped in your own home. You know the stuff I'm talking about. It leaves that white crusty ring in your toilet. It clogs your pipes in your water heater until you're literally throwing money away, paying ransom in your own home. On average, as a matter of fact, about $275 a year extra just to heat your water. Well, I was a hard water hostage until I discovered a way out that really does work. It's installed in my house right now. It's called the GMX Magnetic Water Conditioner. What's magnetics got to do with it? It's space-age technology. It conditions the minerals in the water, eliminates the buildup that drives both of us crazy. GMX conditions your water so it won't stick to your skin, hair, food, clothes, appliances, car, and pool. The cost? Four to six hundred dollars, depending on the size of your house, and it comes with a 90-day money-back guarantee. Call toll-free 1-800-4060-GMX. That's 1-800-4060-GMX. Call day or night. Write the number down. 1-800-4060-GMX. We all know that information is what it's all about. And for those of you who like looking over the edge, well, I've got some really hot news for you. It's called UFO Facts World Report, and it's a hot monthly newsletter packed with just the kind of information you've been looking for. The latest hard data on UFO sightings, encounters, abductions, and more. Gleaning information from around the country and around the world, UFO Facts newsletters put together by a staff of professional journalists. It's sent to you every month so you get the latest developments on this timely and elusive subject. For an introductory price of just nineteen ninety-five a year, you'll have access to all this phenomenal information distilled into an objective and concise newsletter. UFO Facts plugs you into the best thinkers and analysts on the subject. Find out what's happening from government cover-ups to the nuts and bolts of encounters and abductions. Call 1-800-830-9830. That's 1-800-830-9830. Operators are waiting to take a credit card 24 hours a day or send your check for 1995 to Box 27. 57 Anaheim, California, 92814. The publisher guarantees you'll find UFO facts indispensable or your money back. That's 1-800-830-9830. Back now to Greg Long. Greg, are you there? Yes, I am. Um, have you been tempted, uh, Greg, in your years of investigation, or maybe it's happened, I'm sure it has, uh, from moving to a an investigation of what seem to be lights or lights in the sky or balls or whatever they are to so many reports of objects. Uh, I, I ask that because of my own experience. I mean, Greg, what I saw wasn't a ball of light. It, it, there was no mistaking what it was. Well, well, I mean, there was, but it was something, it was either technology uh, that we don't even hint at that we have or it was from somewhere else. That's what I saw. I yeah, I know what you're saying because uh, they're, they're, they were looking la looking at it. One of them is is lights, uh, you know, lights in the sky and uh, balls of light and, and that kind of thing. And, and of course, the the structured objects and that and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I would say I have been tempted in that. Uh, it, it's it's hard to make a connection between the two. Um, and yet, uh, in cases where balls of light have been seen in concentrated areas like Yakima, there have also been, in some cases, uh, structured objects that have been observed. You know, in my study, I did uncover sightings that these fire lookouts had of, of some silver-shaped uh, cigars and, mm. and disc-shaped objects. And so you have to ask yourself whether these are definitely two distinct uh, phenomena, one of them natural and one of them that is uh, manufactured, you know, either on this planet or from, from another one. Uh, and it's very frustrating because when I hear of a sighting such as yourself and others, others have of boomerangs and triangles and this kind of thing, um, you tend to want to think, well, they must be manned by someone. They must be from some other planet. But if we're dealing with a phenomenon that at its source is energy and there is a capability of disguise itself too, uh, and that's the kind of latest thinking that Willie Strieber has, 
you know, we have a phenomenon that is uh, vastly more complex and, and much more frustrating, maybe impossible to be explained. So. Well, under the circumstances, manned might not be the right word, staffed. Greg Long, where are you calling from, please? Pennsylvania. Well, welcome. Hello. Uh, you're talking about uh, ball lightning? Well, uh, maybe. Okay. <laughs> when I was 12, I stepped out in the porch of my uncle's house. It was about 10 a.m. in the morning. And uh, about two feet in front of me, this ball about the size of a basketball, <sighs> made of what appeared to be some sort of electrical charge just passed in front of me scared the life out of me and i ran in the house come back out and was gone well and, I, you know that th there you go see that would be my reaction ball of energy right in front of me goodbye you know, exactly i'm out of here and and so you did that and when you came back it was gone it was absolutely silent no noise i never saw anything like it before or since yeah, what was it what was its color white White. And like a, uh, and the edges had like a static discharge uh, appearance, like as if, like as if it were electric. That's right. Do you have any memory of what the weather was like? It was clear. It was clear. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. That's a good report. Uh, thank you. We're so far out of time, uh, Greg. But I guess the reports, you know, I, on the other hand, I do understand why you're studying this. It's such a, an incredible uh, phenomenon, and it's it's so widespread. And that story, I guess, is fairly typical. Um, ball lightning, clear weather, energy, what's your best guess? Well, you put me on the spot, Art. <laughs> Well, you always save that for last, Greg. You know, you put the guy on the spot. Well, right the, the my end. conclusions after these many years of studying this is that indeed the phenomenon is real. Um, uh, you know, you, we talk about uh, technological devices, triangles, and spacecraft, and that kind of thing. Yes. Remarkably, the, my research has uncovered uh, a significant number of photographs of balls of light, uh, not only in this country, but in other countries, such as uh, uh, the Hestelin uh, sightings in Norway in the late 1980s, as an example. Uh, there really is a lot of good photographic evidence. So I have to conclude that balls of light, spheres of light are real, definitely real. Uh, I think there's some subcategories in which some of these things are... De define, define real for me. Uh, real, you mean... Well, you mean really... They're made, they, they're made of matter. That is, they, they, they're a form of energy. We can see them. We can record them, uh, not only on film, but with uh, our observational, our personal observational uh, systems, our, our visual systems. Um... Uh, they're there. They've been repeated uh, all over this country and other uh, and other countries uh, independently of each other. Uh, so indeed, it's real. Um, my conclusion is, uh, as far as whether it's uh, a UFO phenomenon or not, is that it, indeed it is a UFO phenomenon in that we don't understand what it is. It's, it remains unidentified and unexplained. Good so in enough. That, in that case, it is a classic UFO. Good enough. Greg Long, give me your phone number very quickly, one time. Okay, it's area 503-929-3557. It has been a pleasure having you on the program. Thank you, Greg. Well, thank you very much, Art. I enjoyed it uh, tremendously. Good night. Um, all right, uh, if you would like a copy of this program or any Dreamland program, or you would like to subscribe to our newsletter, the Art Bell After Dark newsletter, the number to call uh, is one 800 Nine one seven four two seven eight. That's one eight hundred nine one seven four two seven eight. Twenty four hours a day. Or don't forget our bulletin board system. Lots of new stuff up there this weekend. Uh, just put up there this weekend. Area code seven zero two seven two seven one seven zero nine. Well, it's been another good one. Thank you all, and from the high desert, good night. People next door with the big house and perfect kids. Nice people, right? Still, wouldn't it be kind of fun to make them uh, squirm with envy? That's right. Have a cookout. Tease the...